Hi folks, welcome again to another episode of Pro Football in the 1970s. I'm your host, Joe Zagorski. Now, thanks to the Sports History Network, a signed copy of my new book, The 2003-Yard Odyssey, The Juice, The Electric Company, and an Epic Run for a Record, will be given away to one lucky fan. It's all about the 1973 Buffalo Bills. Please check out the Sports History Network online for details on how you can win a free copy of my new book on the 1973 Buffalo Bill. Thanks a lot for listening in to today's episode, folks. Look forward to chatting with you again soon in the future. Take care. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience, and today we bring you our 200th regular episode, and this is a huge milestone for us here at Basketball History 101. We started this project almost four years ago in trying to bring back some of those old stories about this game and to keep those stories alive. Our mission from the very beginning was to educate basketball fans on the origins and development of this amazing game and to do it with a little bit of fun. When we first sat down to put a list together of the potential stories, we came up with maybe 40 stories back then. But here we are at 200 regular episodes. The more we read about and research this game, the more ideas just kept popping up from everywhere. We might do a story about one main subject and then realize the depth of the story of a second subject and make that its own episode. In any case, As we give you episode 200, we already have the next 50 episodes planned out and in process of development. So it seems that we will be here for quite a while. And we thank you for coming along with us on this journey through the history of basketball. So let's get on with today's story. The reason we selected Kobe's 81 point game is because for our 100th episode, we did Will Chamberlain's 100 point game. So we figured that for episode 200, we should do the second highest scoring game of all time in NBA history. So I have to take you all the way back to the 22nd of January, 2006. Now, this is the season that Kobe had the highest single season scoring average of his career. He averaged 35.4 points per game that season. And I am a diehard Lakers fan, and even I can admit that the team was not great that year. They were not contenders for the championship. So Kobe put it in his mind that he was going to score as many points as he could that year because he might as well. To put context around this one game, let us take a look at a game that happened just a month earlier in Dallas. Now that was the game where Kobe had 62 points after just three quarters. And this was the amazing part. The entire Dallas Mavericks only had 61 points after those three quarters. Kobe had outscored the entire Mavericks roster by himself for three quarters. The Lakers, as a team, had a 34 point lead after those three quarters, so Kobe sat out the entire fourth quarter of the game. Many fans were upset that Kobe did not try to go for 80 or even 90. It was one of those games where he was scoring at will and should have really gone for it. Nights like that do not come around very often, and this was a perfect situation for Kobe to at least make an attempt at a new record. But Coach Phil Jackson did not want to embarrass the Mavericks. The game was already secured, so if Kobe was going to go for the record, he would have to do it on a different night. But the blueprint was there. If Kobe scored over 60 points in just three quarters, then he could certainly go for 80 or maybe even 90 if he played the entire game. Now, there was this one other thing that was also going on to add more context. The Lakers and the Toronto Raptors only play each other twice a year because they are in opposite conferences. In the first matchup in Toronto in early December of that season, Kobe only scored 11 points. It was his lowest scoring game of that entire season. So when it was time to play the Raptors again in Los Angeles, well, things were going to look a little different. And he had to make up for a poor scoring performance against this team from the first time they played. So on a Sunday evening at the Staples Center, the stage was set for a performance for the ages. The first quarter started out like any normal game. 
Kobe had 14 points in the first quarter, which was not unusual. It was a good start, but nothing that would attract unusual attention. However, the Raptors had a 7-point lead with a score of 36-29, so no significant adjustments needed. The second quarter was similar. Kobe had 12 points in the second, but the Raptors were ahead by 14 points at the halftime with the score of 63-49. to So at this point, it looked very possible that Kobe might go for 50, but it also looked like the Lakers were going to lose the game. I mean, a 50-point game is great, but if the team cannot secure the win, then it takes a bit of the luster off the performance. In listening to Jalen Rose of the Raptors answer questions about this game, he described the halftime discussion that was going on in the Raptors locker room. Kobe was hot, but the Raptors were still winning the game, so there was no need to double-team Kobe or deviate significantly from the game plan. Basically, this was a strategy that the Bill Russell Celtics used against Will Chamberlain back in the 1960s. They often let Chamberlain go for 50 or 60 points as long as the Celtics won the game. By letting Chamberlain score, it turned the rest of Chamberlain's teammates into spectators. It was a great strategy and was essentially what the Raptors were doing with Kobe. Let him score as long as the Raptors win the game. But the third quarter was completely different. And we will share the rest of the story when we come back. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hello, sports history fans. I'm Ross from the podcast Pigskin Tales. You're about to jump into another thrilling sports history moment. But first, let's dive into today's sponsor, just in time for the holiday season. Introducing Art of Words, the brainchild of word artist Dan Duffy from Philadelphia. Dan meticulously crafts stunning images by handwriting relevant words from some of the greatest sports moments in time. These unique budget-friendly illustrations are the perfect gift, sparking cherished memories and capturing hearts. Choose from city skylines, sports, history, and musicians to find a piece for everyone. And here's the exciting part. For that sports fanatic in your life, gift them a piece of their favorite team or player's history. Art of Words tells a compelling story. Explore collegiate stadiums, each meticulously crafted with every football victory etched into words. Or venture into baseball stadiums, handwritten with every player from the team's illustrious history. My favorite on the site is Bryce Harper 2021 MVP year. Because I'm a big stats guy, I think that's one of the coolest things ever. Check it out! Don't wait! Order a print today for yourself and your loved one this holiday season. Transform your wall into a gallery of captivating art and surprise your family and friends with a print of their own. Use code SHN15 at artofwords.com for a 15% discount on your order in November and December. Visit Art of Words, where words magically transform into stunning art, evoking cherished memories and touching the hearts of those who you care about. Again, use the code SHN15 for 15% off at artofwords.com.
Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of Kobe's 81 point performance. Prior to the break, we shared how Kobe had 26 points at halftime, but the Raptors were up by 14 points. Teams play to win, not necessarily to set records, and things were working in the Raptors' favor. However, in the third quarter, the Lakers would flip the script on the Raptors. Kobe scored 27 points just in the third quarter, while the entire Raptors team only scored 22 in that same quarter. Along with the points scored by the other Lakers, they went from 14 points down to start the third quarter to 6 points up at the end of the third quarter. The score at the end of the third quarter was Lakers 91 and the Raptors 85. Kobe had 53 points after just 3 quarters and the crowd was starting to really get into it. They knew that this was the making of something really special. The fourth quarter was no different than the third. Kobe scored 28 points in just the fourth quarter, while the entire Raptors only scored 19. And again, along with the other points from the rest of the Lakers, the Lakers won the game 122 to 104, and Kobe finished with 81 points. The Lakers as a team outscored the Raptors by 32 points in the second half. Kobe outscored the Raptors by 14 points in the second half all by himself. And if you are a fan of Kobe, you have probably seen the highlights. With a few minutes to play, Phil Jackson was about to pull Kobe from the game when the assistant coaches told him to leave Kobe in because Kobe was about to break the Lakers team record of 71 points set by Elgin Baylor. Jackson had completely lost track of how many points Kobe was scoring. But when he finally hit 81, Jackson went ahead and took Kobe out to a standing ovation. The whole thing was completely unbelievable. The NBA did some interviews a few years later to get reactions from some other players from around the league. They talked to Vince Carter, Klay Thompson, LeBron James, Dirk Nowitzki, and Tim Duncan. Now, Klay Thompson was still in high school at the time of the game, but his father, Michael Thompson, was working for the Lakers as a play-by-play -play guy, and Klay was around for that game. And the word that they all kept using Using in the interviews was unbelievable. Duncan said that he thought it was a typo, like they had reversed the digits and Kobe had really only scored 18. But everybody in the league started to see the updates coming through on their phones that Kobe had scored 81. LeBron was watching the game from his home in Ohio and he said that he felt something was brewing by the way that Kobe was scoring so easily. The guy had 55 points in just the second half. Less than 1% of all NBA players have ever had a game of 50 points or more, let alone 50 points in just two quarters. Unbelievable is the right word to describe what Kobe did that night. He was 28 for 46 from the field, including seven made three-pointers. He was 18 for 20 from the free throw line. He also had six rebounds, two assists, three steals, one block, three turnovers, and just a single personal foul. Once Kobe was asked who was the second leading scorer for the Lakers that night and he didn't know, the interviewer had to remind him that it was Smush Parker with 13 points. And there is one last thing that I want to clarify and give ESPN the credit for because they're the ones that figured this out, but some people give Jalen Rose a hard time about giving up 81 points to Kobe Bryant. They even did a commercial together with Kobe and Jalen where they run into each other at a restaurant and Kobe orders 81 olives for his martini just to rub it into Jalen's face. But ESPN broke down Kobe scoring possession by possession and it turns out that because of switching and substitutions that Kobe only scored 18 points when Jalen Rose was his defender. The other 63 points were against other players. So let us take it easy on Jalen Rose. He did not give up 81. He only gave up 18. So for me, I was not able to watch the game that night as I was living in Chicago at the time and could not get the Lakers game on my television. I only found out about Kobe's 81 points by reading the newspaper the next day. And just like Tim Duncan, I also thought it was a typo. It just did not make sense to me. I figured the Raptors would double and triple team Kobe if that is what it would take to stop him but they never did. Now, I understand why they left Kobe single covered in the first half, because the Raptors were winning the game. But as their lead evaporated, why did Toronto still not double team Kobe? He was tearing them apart. And if you watch a replay of the game, they left Kobe single covered all the way to the end. Now, as a Lakers fan, I'm just thankful that they did. The most important thing is the win. And the 81 points was really nice too. Well. 
That is it for today and join us next time when we share our final entry in our series on the lost teams of the NBA. We will cover the last three teams that once played in the NBA but no longer exist. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I will also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Thank you for joining us on this 200th regular episode of Basketball History 101. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, aka the football history dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and we're able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.